Good morning. Glad you guys came out. This is a little different than our typical uh, Sunday school class hour. We're not having some of our kids in youth classes. Uh, we're combining everybody together. Uh, we have Roger Johansson, Pastor Roger, and his family, uh, some of his family, with us today. So we're going to be taking some time this morning to get to know them a little better and also to talk about missions, to talk about what missions is, uh, what is the right focus for missions biblically, and how uh, the local church is to be involved in the work of missions. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump right into uh, let you guys get to know Pastor Roger a little bit better. I've got some questions for him. It looks like he's got some t-shirts and some things, so he, uh, he's going to reward the people who came early, is what he said, with some prizes. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for the joy it is to gather together on the Lord's Day to truly enjoy um, a, a deep spiritual fellowship that happens when your people are together gathered around the word, celebrating Christ and all that's been done for us through him. So, Father, we ask your blessing on this time, and we thank you uh, for all you're doing and all you will do. We ask that you would work in us for your glory. Amen. All right, so it looks like you've got some things for people there. Yes. Good morning. It is a joy bon to Gia. be here. Who said Bon Gia? Really? You hear that? Good job. Man, I was going to ask I'll if you knew how to say good morning to win a shirt, but now I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, you'll take the shirt. Uh, no, I have a couple of shirts. We are uh, ministering in church planning in northeast Brazil in a town called Aracaju. It's about 650,000 people. It's in the smallest state of Brazil, and uh, it's kind of been forgotten by all the mission works, and, and so that's why we're there. And, uh, and so I brought a couple T-shirts that say the name Aracaju on them, and I have a question, and, uh, and the typical, like Michael can't answer, you know, because he usually knows all the answers to the questions, so <laughs> he can't answer. But uh, can you tell me who the, the name of the president of Brazil is? What's that? No. His last name. Pele? Pele. <laughs> he's, he's been really running the country for 40 years. <laughs> That's good. Nobody know? He's a conservative president. He's the first conservative president in like 18 years, 16 years. So we've always had uh, almost communist type presidents for 16 years. So this guy's new and and uh, and being persecuted. That's why Brazil is considered one of the worst places of COVID in the world. It's because the media knows that he's a conservative. They're trying to get him out because elections is next year. His name is Bolsonaro. So you could pray for Bolsonaro, you know, that the Lord, he listens to pastors. He actually stops his car and lets them pray for him, which is kind of a unique thing. He, uh, He's kind of a unique president. He'll, he'll be down and he'll be in his limo and he'll see a bunch of Brazilians playing pool and he'll tell the security to stop and let him shoot some pool with the Brazilians. He's just that type of guy, so that's why he's well-liked. He's just got common sense, anyhow. Not because he shoots pool, but because of other reasons. But. All right, another question. Um, how long have I, what was the year that my wife and I went to Brazil? Does anyone know? <laughs> you can guess it was in the 90s. No? Nope. No? Nope. No. 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 Ninety-five, ninety-one. No. Who said ninety-four? Oh, you did. Come on up. And you did. One of these has P on it. Which one says P on the side? This one does. Okay, give that. There you go. Ninety-four and ninety-four. All right. <laughs> Clap. So now when you wear that shirt, you have to remember Pastor Roger and Crystal and pray for their ministry in Brazil. And it says Aracaju. And you guys have probably heard that as Aracaju or Aracaju or all the different ways we, people try to pronounce it when we're praying for you. But we do pray mm -hmm. for, for you guys um, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So Aracaju is how you say that. Yes. And now we'll know. And I was going to say that, but thank you for saying yeah. that. <laughs> to remember to always pray whenever you wear the shirt for us in our ministry. And, uh, and we have uh, just same prayers as you guys have, prayer requests, that God would use our people to reach other people, 
There's people, God to open doors and for uh, God to save lives, save people. We want, we want to see more Brazilians come to know the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we want to see them changed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And then pray for your leadership uh, you here in, in your church. And then pray for our leadership that God would raise up leaders, Brazilian leaders. And uh, right now we have three guys that are studying from our new church plant to be Brazilian leaders. And uh, in our little experience, uh, it's usually if you have three, one makes it. So, so hopefully one will make it. And, uh, and we are in the midst of, uh, of uh, how do you say it? Um, not, yeah, buying, I guess. We're in the midst of, of, of getting a property and a place that would be ours instead of renting, because we're renting right now. And for, because the dollar is so strong right now in Brazil, it's a great buy and it's a great time. And we just confirmed, uh, since I've been here, our guys in Brazil have confirmed that this building will work for us. It's a good, it's a good match. And it's about $95,000 for it, but it's the whole thing. So can you imagine for $95,000, you got your whole building, land, everything done. So for me as a church planner, I, uh, my goal is to see us get into our building, get people, and get uh, leaders. And so, so if we get the property and these guys actually mature out to become pastors, um, I'm done. And then I can retire and live with Will Moneymaker the rest of my life. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking, Will. <laughs> Will's going, no. <laughs> hey, I do want to say thank you guys so much for everything you've done for us and praying for us. And then I especially do want to thank Will and Nancy. They've uh, let us house in their home and, you know, at first it seems like a good thing, and after about two weeks is gone, it seems like a hard thing, doesn't it? When you have, it's because uh, you, you have a different family, you have, you know, my kids are in there, and we're taking up space, and, and so I sure appreciate their, uh, their love and their unconditional uh, opening arms to let us use their place and use their storage. Believe it or not, missionaries, what do they do with Christmas stuff and, and old photos of family and you know, my mom's about to die, and she's, she's 85, and she's got a house full of photos. And I'm scared that she's going to die. I'm asking God to rapture us all out so we don't have to do with the photos, you know. But, uh, so, but there's just amazing, isn't it? Think about all the stuff you have in your house. Isn't it amazing how much stuff you accumulate? I've only been here a month and a half, and I'm afraid to think about what we have to pack to take back to Brazil already. So, anyhow. Well, why don't you tell us, um, you know, not everybody here knows you guys. Tell us a bit about your family. My wife, if she could stand up, it's Crystal. She's from Columbus, Ohio. I met her at Calvary Bible College. And then you can sit. And then Juliana is my girl. You can stand, Juliana. I like to embarrass you. All right. And then James, he doesn't get embarrassed. There you go. Yeah. All right. And he's 12. Juliana's 16. James is 12. I have three older boys, um, Joshua, Jordan, Jonathan. Joshua's married to Emma. And they have two children, one in, one in the making and uh, one named Esther. So I'm a grandpa already, which is really a joy. And then Jordan, my second son, that's why we're here in the States right now, is because he just got married and uh, just got back from his honeymoon. So it was really fun to see them together. His wife, Kira, and they live in Kansas City, are in Olathe, and go to Countryside. Uh, and then there's Jonathan. He's single. He's 20. If there's any young gals that love the Lord, no, I'm joking. But uh, you're not joking at all. <laughs> well, if this is recorded and he's listening, I so no, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. but he is. He's a good man, and he's uh, he actually went to Topeka to Washburn Tech. Is that right? Mm -hmm. To get that heating and cooling degree. Instead of going to college and getting a bill, he he did that, and then uh, he uh, when he finished before he finished, he was already hired. So what a great deal. Uh, what a great thing uh, Kansas has here. So he is living in Overland Park and going to countryside, but he's still single. Anyhow. So why don't you recap um, maybe a quick history. Mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about buying a building you know, with this church, but this isn't the first church you've planted in Brazil. So give us a bit of a history of your guys' ministry down there in Brazil. So in 1994, we went to Brazil. And we had to learn the language. It's Portuguese. Uh, a gente fala português. I don't say se vocês falam. So we had to learn how to speak Portuguese. And that was basically our first year after Portuguese class and learning and adapting to the culture. We moved to Maceió, a city of one million. And that's uh, in the northeast as well. 
and that's where we started church planning. And in Montreal, the Lord blessed, and through 25 years of ministry, uh, God allowed us to plant various churches and uh, start a Bible Institute and see multiplication be done. And so once there was a, a good, solid group of Brazilian leaders, that's what we felt like was the time for us to move on, and that's where we're at right now. We moved on to another area, and this area is called Aracaju, as you have shared. But we work with the team. You know, if we look in Acts, we always see church planning done in teams. And so we have a team. Adam Lancaster is part of our team. He's American. And then we have a Brazilian named Edioma Maya. He's part of our team. And then we have a single gal. She's a, a Kiza, but she's only going to be with us till the end of the year because she's getting married. And so I tried to convince her to get married and live in our city so she can keep helping with the church plant. But I don't think her husband doesn't work out good with him yet. So that's where we're at right now. And so we're in a brand new field. So there's no churches planted in this field that we're at. This is the first one of our mission planting there. Okay. So <clears throat> a question that sometimes I will talk to people about, especially younger people who are considering what does God want me to do with my life, is the idea of a call, you know, feeling called to the mission field. So describe for us sort of how God brought you to the place you are now in terms of your sense of calling into missions? So when I was, uh, I got saved at eight years of age at a five-day club. So you guys that work with kids and five-day clubs, praise the Lord for you and your faithfulness. And then at the age of 12, my uncle was a missionary to Brazil, and he was back on furlough, and he was taking his kids to Awana. And, uh, and so then he went and grabbed me and took me to Awana. And at 12, I went to Awana, and I thought I was a pretty good kid. And, uh, and learning the, the verses, I, I remember re learning a verse. I don't remember the verse, but I just remember that the verse it just struck me that I need to be like my uncle. I need to be a missionary. And that desire just grew in me, and that desire kept growing within me until the point to where I felt like I needed to go to Bible college. And, uh, and then, therefore, that God just kind of continued to confirm that desire that he was growing in, within me. So that would be kind of my call. Mm -hmm. So you felt that. We talk about an inward call. Mm -hmm. You felt that as a child, and that only grew. Mm -hmm. So what people around you on the outside were confirming that and saying, yes, we think that that, that is what God wants you to do. Yeah, and that's a good word. I think there's an inward and an outward aspect to it, right? You know, the inward is that God gives you the desire. Like First Timothy talks about a pastor, mm -hmm. the position of the pastor. It's a desire given. And then there's the outward where people start recognizing your gifts and, and calling and, and desires. And so um, I would say a, a big, big instrument in my life for the outwardly was my uncle, who was a missionary already. And so he kind of guided and directed me to Kansas City. And then, uh, and then once in Kansas City, I joined with Countryside. Uh, I actually didn't join right away because it didn't exist. But then when it started coming into existence, you know, then we joined up with Countryside, and in Countryside, the local church kind of confirmed uh, some of our uh, gifts and abilities and the call. So what were you doing in your local church before you went to Mission Field? At Countryside? Yeah, you were just kind okay. of hanging out, maybe attending once in a while, or what did that yeah. look like? <laughs> <laughs> Shooting pool, yeah. Well, I was looking in the front of the church, which was a, just a library, and there was an eight-year-old boy sitting and paying really good attention. And I went up to tell this eight-year-old little boy that he does a really good job of paying attention to his father. And the eight-year-old little boy said, well, my father said I can glorify God just as much as an adult. And that eight-year-old boy is Pastor J.D. So, well, I wasn't asking for the Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but uh, now, when you got to Countryside, when your, your church is brand new, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ministries that need to be done, and so we did anything. You know, I worked with Children's Hour of Worship and scared the daylights out of the kids about the, la you know, the last days. And uh, so I was learning. I was learning to work with kids, you know, because I, I was telling about the pool of blood, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the kids started crying, and I went, what are you crying for? We, we win. <laughs> and uh, and so, uh, so that was... <laughs> So that was good lessons for me to learn how to work with kids. And, uh, and then uh, they put me into positions of uh, areas that I probably didn't enjoy as much, like administrating, getting uh, curriculum for Sunday school. And uh, that was something that wasn't like, you know, a joy, joy. But it was a good thing for me to learn. So they put me in different positions. They tried to put me in different positions 
to develop me and to help me to get honed on what is a local church and what it takes to run a local church. So how would you describe the church's place and sort of your commissioning and sending once it came time to go? Um, mm. what, just, just talk about that relationship you have with the local church. Yeah, let's, let's open up the Bible. Because you, you weren't Acts. doing the travel around to 50 churches to right. raise support. is a little bit different. Yeah, let's turn to Acts 13. Yeah, if we could have somebody read Acts 13, verse 1, 2, and 3. Acts 13, 1, 2, and Very good. I think now I'll go to chapter 14, verse 26 and 27 and 28. 26, 27, So what we see here in Acts is that Paul and his church planning team was prayed for, set apart, and then they were, they were sent, verse 3, chapter 13, uh, they were sent off. And obviously, as we, we look at verse 4 and on in chapter 13, they, they, they got a ship and they sailed away. And so obviously they were sent with finances to be able to ca catch a, a ship. And uh, they went to do the work of the Lord. And if we read chapter 13 and 14, we'd see that they preached the gospel. And, in, and then they uh, not only preached the gospel, they gathered the believers. In chapter 14, they, um, in verse 20, 22, they were strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. And, uh, and, then in, and then in verse 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed what? Elders. Elders. And so what we see is that Paul was concerned about getting the gospel out and concerned about gathering the people. And then he was concerned about making sure that they had leadership. And then, then interesting, in verse 26, he goes back to the church that sent him. And, uh, and, and as he goes back to that church, he gathers the church together and reports all that God had been doing through them. And then he stayed with them. Uh, a pretty good time uh, making continuing the work of discipleship with that church. So we kind of see here, we know that the book of Acts is a, it's not prescriptive, but it's descriptive. It's just describing to us what happened in the beginning, the birth, and the expansion of the church. But it's interesting, we see a, a glimpse of missions. You know, we see a group of guys who are, who are prepared, who have been working in the local church. If we looked in, in Acts chapter 11 and 12, we see that Paul was working in the church of Antioch. Who was it that called Paul to Antioch? Do you remember? Barnabas. And Barnabas called him there, and, uh, and then they worked together, and they we had some responsibilities. They weren't just brand new people in the church. They weren't just new, newly saved. They were uh, tried guys, and they had been proven, and they had been spending time there and ministering to the local church. And so the local church was getting rid of their best workers really mm -hmm. it's kind of like what we did with countryside going to lawrence nobody at countryside wanted to get rid of pastor jd you know that and uh, i was there when all that process was going on and 
And they actually were thinking of other pastors to send. They were like, man, maybe we could send that guy, you know, and maybe we could send that. <laughs> but they didn't want to get rid of Pastor J.D. And, but the right way is to get rid of Pastor J.D. No, I'm joking. But uh, to get rid of the good guy, the, the cream of the crop. And, and I mean that with all sincerity. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, people think, well, missionaries couldn't do anything in the United States work-wise, so they went to the mission field. You know, mm -hmm. some people think that. But it's not what we see here in, in the book of Acts. And, and then we see them, uh, Paul, even though he's an apostle, he takes the local church serious and prioritizes them and to the point that he reports to them and shares about what God had been doing. And, and in verse 26, chapter 14, I love how it is say, stated. It says like this, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God. And so it was in Antioch that Paul says he was committed to do this work of, of missions, and uh, even though he had a call way back in Acts chapter 9, and so we see that the local church is, is very key and very important. So we ask ourselves this, you know, how is missions done? How do I, what, how do I know missions? What do I, why, why, did, why do we do missions the way we do? And in our mission, uh, I work with a mission called Brazil Gospel Fellowship Mission, and we have most of our missionaries are supported by 100 people in six churches. And, uh, and I think that's pretty much the norm for a lot of missionaries. And praise God, they got their support that way. But at Countryside, Countryside tried to do a little differently. They wanted to say, hey, let's, let's look at Scripture and see what, what kind of example Scripture gives to us. And this was the best example that they could get. And so they saw, well... Paul was part of the Church of Antioch, and so just like any leadership, he, you know, he is part of the church. And so, they, so Countryside decided to support totally their missionary. And, uh, and so we were the first ones that they did that with. And they weren't really sure how that was going to play out, you know, because they only had 125 people at that time. But, uh, but they decided to do it, and they made that commitment, made that step. And so what did that do? Well, that made us as a couple feel like, wow, we really need to come back to Countryside and serve at Countryside. And so when we come back on furlough, we come back to Countryside. We don't run across the nation. We don't, you know, put together a song and dance and make it look really good and, you know, get Crystal to play the piano at the right time when I'm appealing about money. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't do that. And I'm not trying to degrade any missionaries that do that, but it's almost like we've for, we forced missionaries to do that. You know, it's almost like we've, we've forced missionaries to have to have the best show. And, uh, and whoever has the best show or, or the most appealing, whoever has the best emotional intelligence, you know, <laughs> uh, who can appeal to our emotions uh, is the one who wins. And, and, uh, and so uh, Countryside just wanted to get away from that. Countryside wanted uh, the body, the local body, to know who their pastor missionary was know his strengths, know his weakness, know his family. Uh, most people at our church know everybody in my family. You know, they know Joshua, Jordan, Jonathan, Julian, and James. They know all five of them. And, uh, which is interesting, because when I was at Calvary Bible College, I traveled uh, with Calvary, and trying to you know, represent them in certain different things for a ministry for one semester. And the pastors of certain different churches would ask me, say, what are you gonna do, son? So I wanna be a missionary. Where to? Brazil. And they said, and I, I remember a pastor saying, hey, honey, what's the name of our missionary in Brazil? And so, you know, they may have a board full of 40, 30 different missionaries, but they really don't know them, you know. And so Countryside had a different philosophy. They wanted to, to know their missionaries, and they wanted their people to know the missionaries, and they wanted the missionaries to fill uh, the responsibility to the local church. And so that's kind of yeah, that's the basis for what we have done. So what's that relationship with your sending church looked like um, over the years? So then what happened, what happens then is because Countryside has such a commitment, you know, they're very interested and they send people down almost every year. Well, I would say every year, every year we have somebody coming from Countryside visiting us and which is really neat, you know, because if you looked at other missionaries who are supported by a lot of churches, they may get a church come down once every four years, three to four years, but we every year have people come down, whether it's individuals or a team from Countryside. Um, what's that look like? Countryside's always concerned about our financial aspect. Uh, they wanna make sure that we're well supported. 
So I'm not, I'm not calling back Countryside and going, hey, can you raise my support? You know, it's really nice, Countryside saying, hey, we're going to raise your support, and, uh, which is a really nice thing. And uh, one time we, uh, we represented to Countryside everything that we spent and, and after we did that, Countryside decided to give us a raise of $1,000 a month. So that was pretty nice of them, wasn't it? I said, man, I'll show you where I spend my money all the time. You know? <laughs> and uh, so, so it just shows their commitment uh, mm -hmm. to you. And, and, um, and then also, uh, like I said, in prayer, just the details in prayer. You know, I had one professor once say, well, you don't want one church supporting you because you want to have a lot of people praying for you. And I disagree, but I didn't disagree with him right away because he's older than me and I respected him. But later on, uh, I got to speak on radio to tell why I disagreed. <laughs> Isn't it terrible? Um, <laughs> but I didn't mention his name. I just said that, do you want 200 people praying or 2,000 people praying, bless the Johansons, I think they're in Brazil, or do you want 200 people saying, Lord, help Roger. He struggles sometimes with anxiety in this area. Help him to trust you. Help Crystal in detail. And the Bible says the fervent prayer of what? Righteous a righteous man. man availeth much. And so it's not like the quantity of people. And so, so that's what we get. And then, you know, coming back, we get pastoral care. You know, I was a young man. I was only 23 when I first started on the mission field. And I remember Pastor Mike coming and visiting and checking out us out and seeing how we're doing in our marriage and seeing how we're doing our child rearing, and that was really good. It was really important, and especially at the beginning, I was really fired up for ministry, and I was doing really well in ministry, but I was kind of neglecting my two little boys, and, and Pastor Mike just gave me a good slap in the face spiritually and said, correct it or come back, uh, you know, and, uh, and I was like, wow, I can't believe I was doing that, you know, because I know that I'm supposed to be taking care of my family. But it was so nice to have a pastor come down and not just be glamorized by the ministry, but be able to have the intimacy to ask the hard questions. So what is your relationship like with the pastors at Countryside? Well, I'm one of the pastors of Countryside. If, as a matter of fact, today we're supposed to be taking pictures. I forgot my coat, but on the way there I'll get my coat. And, uh, but uh, you'll see on there the staff of Countryside. And on the staff you'll have Pastor Mike, Michael, uh, Otto and Scott, and then you'll see Pastor Brian, who's uh, Brian Warren from our missionary in Mexico, and you'll see Pastor Roger in Brazil. And so we're just one of the pastors and being part of the elders uh, at Countryside. So um, talk a little bit about your, your method. You've talked about your goal in missions, which is sharing the gospel to gather believers together pulling that out from Acts, and then establishing elders in those churches. So your, your goal is very church-centric, it seems, pulled from, from Acts. So what's your methodology? How do you get from point A to point B? Because I think sometimes we think about missions, and we see all the stuff that's being accomplished, and we go, wow, I, I, I wonder how they do that. So what's, what's your, your method? What's the, the yeah. things that you do on the mission field? Yeah, and that's good. That's a great question. You know, what do you do? Uh, when you, what do you do when you come to a new city? Imagine coming to the city of Lawrence, and where do you start? What part do you go to, and what do you do? Well, we, uh, when we got into Aracaju, I'll use that as an example. Um, I always think of um, protection for my family, and, uh, and so I need to think of my family. So I find a place to live that would be safe for my family, and then once I find a place to live that's safe for my family, then they're going to be neighbors, right? And so we reach out to those neighbors. And so the first thing is we need we need commitment. We need committed a committed team, a committed people in prayer, and uh, and so that's what we need. But then we need contacts, and uh, we just need to make contacts. And everybody's a contact. If I need to. Uh, make another key for the house that I'm renting or, or owning. The guy that's making the key is a contact. He's a soul that needs to hear the gospel. And so we just need to get the, the gospel out. We need to get the seed out of the bag and let God work, you know, and God does the work. Uh, my son and I like to play tennis. So Brazilians play tennis. And so we're playing tennis. And when we play tennis, there's a guy, uh, instructor, teaching us how to play tennis properly. And so we're witnessing to him and to his family. And then he's introducing us to all kinds of people 
you know, that, uh, that are contacts. So everybody's a contact. So Crystal, my wife, might do Pilates. Is it called Pilates? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is that what we call it? All right. And uh, she might do Pilates, and so the Pilates instructor is telling her how to stretch and do everything, you know, and so my wife's doing all the stretching, and she's there for the stretching, but she's there for what? Share the gospel and get the seed out. And, and then, so really, that part is, is never ending. You know, we always are doing that from day one to the, to the last day that we're in the church, is always getting the seed out. And then there might be, that would be spontaneous evangelism. Then there's strategic evangelism in the sense of, you know, we may say, hey, we're going to target this area and we're going to, uh, we're going to do an event in that area. And like we've done volleyball tournaments before or sports, sports events, or we've done uh, someone open their home and we did a children's hour of worship, or five day club. And uh, we, we packed we packed the place out because we told all the kids we'd buy them uh, picoles. What are picoles? Popsicles. So hey, we're gonna buy you a popsicle if you come. And the place was packed full of kids. Man, you should have seen it. They were all there for the popsicle. But we shared the gospel with them, and uh, and then and then we get opportunity to get to know their family. And so contacts, contacts, contacts. So you have spontaneous contacts and strategic contacts. And, and then we've done like even uh, once we've known. It seems like God gives you somebody that knows more people. For example, um, I was preaching at someone's home, and back in those days, we didn't have cell phones, and this guy with no shirt on goes to the public phone to use it. He hears some Americans, you know, speaking Portuguese, and he's interested in what this guy, this foreigner, is saying, but he has no shirt on. Well, my wife says, no, sit down. And so he sits down and, uh, and listens to the, to the sermon. And obviously I see him because there's not very many people. And so afterwards I go to him and I can smell the alcohol in his breath. So he's a local alcoholic. But he invites me to his house. So I go to his house and he invited all his alcoholic friends. So all his alcoholic friends are there. And I got to share the gospel. Well, one of the alcoholic friends invites me to his house. So I go to his house and share the gospel again. And he comes to church, and he invites two other couples to church. And those two other couples come to church, get saved, and stay there to this day. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, I just don't know who God is going to save and who's going to be an influence to reach other people. And so, so sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, you never imagine doing some, or, or never imagine having a couple's encounter really quick, but all of a sudden you got... God saves a couple that knows four other couples, five other couples, and so you do a couples encounter uh, to reach out to help couples with their marriage, but help them with the main problem, which is sin, right? So then once they're saved, then we have to bring them together, and then we do what I call church. You know, I have to have another C. So we had commitment, contact, and now we have church. And so to do church, what do you have to have for church? You know, it's really interesting to see all the cultural things in your church. You guys have a lot of cultural things here, don't you? You do, what, can you name some cultural things that you guys have in your church? Music. Music's a big cultural thing. Yeah. You guys have, uh, you know, different instruments. And how do you sing? Do you guys sing standing up, sitting down, both ways? Yeah. Do you guys, uh, do you guys jump up and down when you sing? Not usually. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Why is that? Because it doesn't feel good, huh? <laughs> yeah, because we're stale. We're what? Okay. Man, are you an English teacher? Okay, very good. Wait, what does the first state mean? <laughs> English is kind of his second language now, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so like a cultural thing for Brazilians would be one of the things is, is as they come to church, they would touch and talk to the person by them, and, you know, they'd be turning and touching everybody and, uh, you know, maybe blowing kisses in the air and, and, and dance. Yeah, yeah, and then David had a culture, didn't he? Yeah, and, and we have a culture, and so 
Um, why am I talking about the culture? Because we're talking about church. And so we try not to make an American church, but it's hard not to because it's the only culture we really know. But we try to adapt Brazilian stuff in and do different things, but anyhow. So you have to do church, and so you have to think about what does church mean? What do you have to have to have church? And, uh, and so we have your typical singing, and, uh, and we have the sermon, of course, and we have prayer, and uh, we have time for the kids and teaching and different things like that. Um, and we try to have that time of, of welcoming, you know, just, hey, take a moment to greet the people around you, and, you know, the Brazilians like that. They, you know, it takes them a while to get back, and, but it's okay. And uh, we're a little more worried about everything being in order and quiet. You know, in America, I'm really nervous sometimes because it gets so quiet. You know, in Brazil, it's not that quiet, you know. In Brazil, you could have, you know, a baby crying and nobody worried about it. The only one that's worried about it is the American, you know, which is funny. But anyhow, so you have church, and so you have to have church. And then with church comes people getting saved and getting into ministry. When we first started church, I was the one that was leading songs. I didn't know how to play the guitar very well. I taught myself how to play the guitar. So we would sing Seek Ye First, you know. Seek Ye First the King. It was literally that way. That's how church was. So when you came to our church, that's, well, that was worship. And I would go visit people who would visit us, and I'd say, tell me what you didn't like about our church. And they always said, the music. And I said, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, but until God raises up someone else that can play the guitar better than me, which didn't take long, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so then start plugging people in, and you're discipling, and so maybe that's a key word that we should have said right from the beginning is discipleship, and in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, and that's what it is, is what we're doing is discipling. We're discipling them while they're unsaved, we're discipling them about the gospel and how to get saved. And once they get saved, we're discipling them how to be a mature Christian in Christ. And that has to be serving in the local church in some facet, in some form. And so now we have church. And then as we're doing church, we start seeing who God has given desires to, to administrate the word of God. And so we see people rising up who have desire to study. And so we do a discipleship that's a little more serious. And we call it a Bible Institute, but that's just a nice... American word to put on it, but it really is discipleship, right? And we're training guys uh, to be future pastors. And once those guys are trained and the church recognizes them, and once they're plugged in, then we move on. But now we move on differently. We move on with a commitment that's different. Now we move on with a commitment from countryside and a commitment from that local church in Brazil. And we have more people praying, and we have others desiring to be a part of the team. So you like that? <clears throat> what you described could happen in Topeka, Kansas, just as much as Aracaju, Brazil. Yeah, I would think I had a pastor come down and he said, you know, what you're doing is what we should be doing. And I said, exactly. If, mm -hmm. if what we do on the mission field is not an exception, it's the norm. It should be. It should be the norm. And he was saying, yeah, he was pastoring a church and they, the church was over 150 years old. It's a church from out east, and he said they planted one church so far in 150 years. And he said, and we planted that because it was a hill coming up to the first church, and the people had a hard time going up the hill during the winter time, so they decided to build a church in the bottom of the hill. And that's how their church planted. So how, how many churches have you been involved in starting down there in Brazil? Um, we've been involved with uh, one, two, three, four maybe seven seven churches seven church plants now that's not where i'm the head of every one of those right you know sometimes a brazilian's ahead of that that we had trained but yeah about seven so some of you guys have asked questions about how this church started rewind back maybe eight years roger's back for a visit and he knows we're praying about lawrence he says well let's hop in the car and drive out there so we're driving around lawrence and just scoping things out and i'm asking him about church planting and he's saying, yeah, you just start reaching out to your neighbors and you make strategic contacts as well. Invite people to a Bible study. You'd be surprised how many people would say yes if you're having this conversation with the guy making your key at Home Depot. Something about the Lord comes up and you say, hey, would you want to do a Bible study in the book of John? We're getting together a couple people. We'd love to have you join us. And you actually just start it for him, you know. And we started doing that. And 
and, and we came with a team. We had the same support from Ascending Church like you had. So very much of what we've done here has been modeled, and we've learned so much from what Roger and others, and Brian as well, have done, done on the mission field. Because, it, yes, there's the cross-cultural element, but the aspects of, of the goal of missions, our methodology, and the message we have of the gospel mm. is exactly the same. And that translates to different cities in Brazil, to different countries, whether it be Mexico, Brazil, mm. and, and, it, and that happens here as well. Those are the simple things God uses, which means we can be involved, involved in ongoing missions in that type of ministry um, right here. Yeah, the primary means of evangelism is the Word of God. And uh, if we can get people to study the Bible, that is a great thing. And, uh, and what's shocking to me is how many of us have never asked anyone, would you be willing to study the Bible with me? And uh, we don't do that because we always think nobody's interested, do, don't we? And you know what? You're right. A lot of people aren't. I have a lot more people that say no than yes. But you know what happens after you've asked about 12 people? Someone says yes. And, uh, and that one person, remember what he can do. God could use that one person to reach another person that reaches another person that reaches 12 people. Mm -hmm. And they're all in the church because you are faithful enough to ask that question, would you be willing to do a Bible study? And sometimes, you know, we got to be strategic about it. Um, I'd say, I'd ask somebody like this, I'd say, have you ever studied the words of Jesus? I don't want to talk about Baptist, I don't want to talk about Catholic, just Jesus, what he says. And most people in Brazil say, no, we've never studied that. And I said, man, we would love to do that with you. We can do that at your home, we can do that at the workplace, we can do it wherever you want. And no commitment, just one time, one study. And if you like it, we have more. And if you don't like it, we don't have to do any more. And we'll see you at the judgment seat. No, I'm joking. We didn't say that. <laughs> if this sounds interesting to you, um, several years back, Pastor Roger helped put together this study. It really is born out of what he does with people in Brazil. Um, it's a seven-week study through the Gospel of John on the words of Jesus. And we have that study here. We can print it out for you. I can send a PDF to you. If you've got a neighbor, a coworker, you know, a friend from your kid's baseball team or whatever, and you say, man, I, I want to try this. I want to ask somebody to a Bible study. We literally have that ready to go for you. All you have to do is walk through it. It's very simple. It's already laid out. And Pastor Roger um, and several of us helped put all that together. So there's resources here for you to do things like that. So and you may think, man, I don't know enough to teach somebody else. Well, if you're saved, you know Jesus, your Savior, and you know how to read, um, you know enough. Mm -hmm. And a good thing about evangelism is it helps you grow, doesn't it? The more you evangelize, the more you do a Bible study with someone, the more questions are going to be asked, and then you're going to go, whoa, I don't know the answer to that. I better go to my pastor and ask him that question. You know? So it helps you grow as well. Well, we'd love to keep talking, but we're out of time, so we need to wrap up. But thank you for coming early, spending some time with us. Pastor Roger is also going to be preaching here in a few minutes, so you'll get a chance to hear from him as he ministers to us from God's Word. But thank you for sharing your time and, and sharing some of that, those stories with us, because a lot of the people here haven't gotten a chance to know you guys. So this has been, been a real blessing. Thank you. Yeah, this was really fun. And, uh, and, and, you know, we're not saying that Countryside has the model, you know, we recognize that God has used other models throughout the years, but we're just saying, why don't we try to be as close to the book of Acts as we can be? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a lot of benefits for doing that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming early. You're dismissed. <laughs>